Welcome to week three of Drowning in Debt. We've been talking about over the last couple weeks some things you should do with your money so that you don't drown in debt and so that you experience financial peace. First week, we said the first thing you should do with your money is only buy what you can afford so that you avoid what? Debt pain. Remember that? Only buy what you can afford so that you avoid debt pain. First thing you should do with the money God has given you. Second thing we talked about last week is that we should get out of debt quickly so that we become better managers of God's money. Get out of debt quickly so we become better managers of God's money. Now let's just say we live those two things out. I know all of us haven't uh, necessarily done those, but we're working at it. We're, we're debt free except for the house. What should we do with our money then? Debt free except for the house. That's what we're going to talk about today. There's one thing we shouldn't do And there's another thing that we should do when we're debt-free except for the house. Let's first talk about what we shouldn't do. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, if you've got a Bible. Matthew 6, 24. If you've got one of these blue ones, it's on page 8. Do you ever think a pastor would tell you to turn to page 8 in a Bible? It's usually like 1,300 into, you know. If you need a Bible, though, we've got some blue ones in the back. We'd love to give you one. It's a translation that's easy to understand. First, what you shouldn't do if you're debt-free except for your home. Matthew 6, verse 24. This is Jesus speaking. This is powerful. Catch this. Verse 24, Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. But listen to this. You cannot serve both God and, what does Jesus say? Yeah. You cannot serve both God and and money. So the first thing you shouldn't do when you're debt free except for the house is dive right back into debt and become a servant of your money all over again. You shouldn't do that. But that's oftentimes a temptation for us. We get out of most of our debt. We, there's something that we want. We can't really afford it. We get greedy. We buy it anyways and we dive right back into debt. And we get robbed all over again. You say, now, pastor, hang on a second. Is it really robbery? Well, not literally, but sometimes if you're like me, um, you you may be like me in that you feel like you're getting robbed by your debt. Anybody ever felt like that before? Maybe you're getting robbed by your debt. Let me just give you some popular statistics about some debts that are common to most of us. And these really bother me, so I'm going to let them bother you as well. Okay, here are some statistics. Credit cards. 74% of households have credit cards, 74%. And the typical cardholder carries, how many cards do you think? Typical cardholder? Seven. Typical cardholder carries seven cards. The average cardholder has an $8,367 balance, and that's a 160% increase in the past decade. And they carry that balance from month to month, paying an average of 18 0.3% in what? In interest. That amounts to over $1,000 a year in interest payments. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but I could do something with $1,000. And I'd rather not give it to somebody who's already very rich. I'd rather keep it for myself or give it to somebody who needs it. And the question is, does it cost these credit card companies 18.3% to offer us this wonderful service Or are they getting rich at our expense? You tell me. American Bankruptcy Institute did a study showing that 69% of filers say credit card debt caused the bankruptcy. You believe that? 7 out of 10 filers say credit card debt caused their bankruptcy. And now some of you say, okay, pastor, hang on just a second. I got some credit cards. I may have three, may have seven, may have 19. I'm not going to tell you how many I have. But pastor, I just want you to know, I pay them all off every single month. Congratulations. Congratulations. You're in the minority because statistics show that 70% of people don't pay off their cards. And statistics also show that even if you do pay off your card each month, 
you're more likely to buy things on credit than you would with cash. So you end up buying more. And there's always the temptation, if an emergency comes, to not do what? To not pay off the card. It can be dangerous. Car loans. I want to show you a video that's really going to make you mad. Can can I do that? It's going to make you mad. But I think by the end of it, you're really going to like it. Let me show you a video. Americans, we love our cars, don't we? Where else on earth can we find a couple who is flat out broke, living paycheck to paycheck with two new cars in the driveway? Here's the problem. We've been conditioned to believe that we'll always have a car payment. The average price of a new car is $26,000, which means that many of the cars you see driving around are dragging behind a $464 car payment. And after about four years, the car that you just couldn't live without has lost about 70% of its value and you have over a year's worth of payments left on it. So that means you could end up paying $33,000 for a car that's only worth $6,000. That sweet ride just doesn't seem so sweet anymore, does it? Well, that's okay because that's the normal way of thinking. We're gonna try something just a little bit different. Let's say you now drive a nice, clean, much less expensive car, and you pay yourself the $464 each month. In just 10 months, you'll have $4,640. And if you add that amount to the $1,500 that your current car is worth, you can now pay cash for a $6,000 car. Now, in just 10 months, that's a major upgrade. And here's the best part. You don't owe the bank a dime. Let's not stop there. In another 10 months, you'll have another $4,640. Add that to the $6,000 you can get for your last upgrade, and now you're driving an $11,000 car. So in just 20 months, you've gone from a $1,500 car to an $11,000 car that you own. And here's the best part, you still don't owe the bank a penny. By now, most people aren't even halfway through their payment books. They still got 44 months of payments left. So just for kicks, let's see what happens if you continue to pay the $464 that everyone else is paying to the bank to yourself and a good mutual fund over the next 44 months. When most people are making the last payment on that car that they just couldn't live without, a car that is now worth less than 30% of what they originally paid for, Not only are you driving a great paid for car, but because of our new plan, you now have a mutual fund that you've earmarked as the car replacement fund. Now, how much money do you have in that fund? Well, at the stock market average of 12%, you now have $26,000. Here's where things get really crazy. You can take $10,000 out of this fund and still have $16,000. Now, Let's add the $10,000 to the value of your current vehicle, and that's going to allow you to pay cash for a $12,000 to $17,000 vehicle. And at 12%, the $16,000 still in the fund will make enough interest for you to be able to do this every five years. Folks, that's free cars for life. That's what happens when you let your money work for you. You will never have a car payment the rest of your life. Financial Peace University. Learn how to beat debt, build wealth, and live like never before. Now, does anybody in here wish they would have seen that in high school? Come on. How many wish you would have just make you mad? Yeah, I'm telling you. Even though the stock market isn't quite there right now, okay? You still save money to buy that car. Home loans. Everybody agrees that, that a home is a great investment, right? But if you finance that thing over 30 years that low interest rate can really add up. Listen to this. You buy a $150,000 home, you finance the $150,000 over 30 years at 6.5%. Listen, you end up paying $191,000, not total, in interest. What? $191,000 in interest. So over the 30-year period, you end up paying approximately $350,000 thousand dollars for your hundred and fifty thousand dollar home that bothers me a little bit but listen to this scenario hundred fifty thousand dollar home over 15 years 15 years instead of 
30 is 6.5%. You end up paying $85,000 in interest, which you still go, that's a lot of money, but you save about $100,000 by financing your home over 15 years rather than 30. Now, some of you go, I could never do that, Pastor. That would probably double my monthly payment. That would double my monthly payment, right, Pastor? Would that double your monthly payment if you move from 30 to 15? It would not. It increases your monthly payment by about a third. You pay it off in 15 years. Increases your monthly payment by about a third. Now, some of you say, hey, that would be cool. I would want to do that. But Pastor, I don't have a third to add to my monthly payment. Don't have it. I think many financial advisors then would recommend that we buy homes that we can afford to pay off in 15 years. Now, if you're like me and you're saying, hey, I don't want to feel like I'm getting robbed anymore by my debts, I think financial advisors would probably recommend we do three things. Three things. Number one, cut up the credit cards and grab some debit cards. Number two, pay for cars with cash or pay them off quickly. And number three, buy a home that you can afford to pay off in 15 years. So what we shouldn't do with our money when we're debt free except for the house is just dive right back in to debt and become a servant of our money all over again. We shouldn't do that. Let's talk about what we should do though. It's found in Matthew 25 verse 14. Matthew 25, 14. In the Blue Bibles, it's on page 33. Matthew 25, 14. I won't have the words on the screen because it's kind of a long passage, but you can just listen as I, I read. This is Jesus speaking. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing in proportion to their abilities. He then left on his trip. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earn five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more, but the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. The servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I have earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The servant who had received the two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest invest and I have earned two more the master said well done my good and faithful servant you've been faithful in handling this small amount so now I will give you many more responsibilities let's celebrate together then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said master I knew you were a harsh man thanks harvesting crops you didn't plan and gathering crops you didn't cultivate I was afraid I would lose your money so I hid it in the earth I hid it in the ground look here's your money back but the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant, you wasteful person. That's what he's saying. If you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one with 10 bags of silver. To those, here's the principle, to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. So what you should do with your money when you're debt free except for the house is save some and invest some and let your money work for you rather than against you. Invest, save. Notice in the parable, the, the master commended the first two servants because they did what with his money? What did they do? They invested it. They were wise managers of the master's money. But the third one he rebuked and called them wicked and lazy. Why? Because he wasted the money. He wasted the master's money. But here's what's crazy. Check this out. The very beginning of the passage, listen to what Jesus said. He said, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated like this. What's that, Jesus? The kingdom of heaven, he said, is a lot like this. God is the master. We are his servants. And he entrusts us with his money. We have two options. Either we can invest his money, being wise managers of that which he's given us, or we can do what with it? We can waste it. We can invest his money. That's what this parable is teaching. Or we can uh, waste it. 
And if we invest it, we'll be good stewards, good managers of his money. If we waste it, we won't be. Now, I think if we all had to be honest, I'm going to be honest here for a second, we would all say, you know, there have been times in our lives where we have wasted God's money. Not our money, God's money. And I know that for sure has happened to me on multiple occasions. Let me tell you about one. My wife and I first got married about a year after we were married. We got, don't get jealous, we got a 20 thousand dollar inheritance check from one of emily's relatives and we were like we just won the lottery jackpot 20 grand can you spell party because that's what we're gonna do we're gonna have some fun with 20 grand and so the thought kind of crossed our mind hey maybe we should pay off some debt maybe we should invest some but that's for old people like 50 and gray hair some of y'all are like, I don't even like you, pastor. Never did, all right? So we just thought, no, you do that later. You don't do that at 23, 24 years old. No, you don't pay off debt and invest. That's for crazy old people, all right? You don't do that. And so we thought, no, we just, we need to figure out a good way to spend this money. And so you'd think I'd learn from past lessons that I shared with you a couple weeks ago, but I had not. And so we went out and bought a what? A car. Another car story. You're like, oh my goodness. Yeah, we went out and bought a car. Cars have given me problems, if you can't tell, okay? And so bought, bought this car. So we pull 12 grand out of the 20 grand, and we put the other 8 grand. Do we put it in savings? No, we put it in checking so we can use it if we need it, right? And so, uh, so we got the 12 grand, and we buy this car. Now, we drive this car for about a year, and we're liking this car, but we're thinking, we still got 8 grand we could spend think about what kind of souped up car we could get with eight thousand dollars more and so we took that eight thousand back out and we sold that first car for eight thousand taking a net loss of four thousand put the eight on top of the eight and bought a sixteen thousand dollar car still not having paid off any debt and now having zero dollars in savings but at least we looked good in our cars, right? I mean, we were looking, looking pretty good. Yeah, here's kind of what ended up happening. We have, since then, we're still driving that car. We've taken, uh, it has depreciated some, and so we've taken a net loss out of that $20,000 inheritance check of about $10,000, and we're driving a car that's worth about $10,000, and it's continuing to depreciate. Now, question. Does that make us wise managers of God's money? As we look back, in hindsight, we think not. Instead, what we probably should have done is we probably should have said, okay, we got this $20,000 inheritance check. Let's uh, pay off some debt. Okay, pay off my debt there. Let's uh, invest some. Let's save some, get an emergency fund going, all that kind of stuff. And then we can buy this car that we want with cash. But we said that's for old people. We're buying the car now. And we look back and go, mistake. Mistake. We realize that one thing we should do when we're debt free, when we pay off our debt, is invest, save some of the money. You say, hey, I'm with you, Pat. That's probably really important. But where should we invest our money? Where should we invest? Let me give you four great ways to invest your money that financial advisors would recommend. This is the practical part of the message. Four great ways financial advisors would recommend to invest our money. First is this, a larger emergency fund. It's really savings more than anything. A larger emergency fund. You should have your $1,000. We talked about last week. Maybe you got your $1,000 before you start your debt snowball. But most financial advisors recommend that you have three to six months expenses in savings. Now, let's not, you know, have everybody raise their hands that have three to six months expenses in savings because there might not be anybody in here. Some of us are like, we got a week, you know, I got a day in savings. No, I don't, I don't have very much. Most would recommend, hey, a great place, great way to invest, save some money is in a larger emergency fund. And that way, when emergencies come into your life, they're not really emergencies. They're not really crises. They're just inconveniences because you've already got the money you've got the money you've been saving you got it you can pay for the emergency it's not a crisis it's just an inconvenience great way to invest save some of your money larger emergency fund number two retirement funds thinking ahead thinking about the future retirement funds 401ks Roth IRAs financial advisors recommend these the match with your company check this out though USA Today this shocks me. USA Today reports that out of 100 people age 65, listen to this, out of 100 people age 65, 97 of them can't write a check for $600. Out of 100 people age 65, 97 can't write a check for 600. 54 of them are still working, and three of them are financially secure. Three. 
out of 100. Here's the alternative. This is Adam and Christy Ivy. Adam is a worship pastor and Christy is a nurse. This is from Dave Ramsey's book, Total Money Makeover. It has some cool stories in it. Listen to what he says, Adam. I started listening to Dave a little under two years ago. And in that time, we have become completely debt-free with the exception of our house. We have a fully funded emergency fund. We have two very nice vehicles, both of which are completely paid for. And as we keep paying double toward our monthly mortgage bills, we will have our house paid off in about five years years now listen to this this is what's cool the amazing thing is we're only in our mid-twenties now is he a doctor is he a lawyer he's a worship pastor go see brandon ask him how much he makes afterwards okay so i I first got into debt before my wife and i were married i just thought you were supposed to finance cars and that's what i did you can't have a car without a loan right one point i was working three jobs to pay off our debt I think the bank was wondering what in the world was going on when my car payments started coming in triple the required amount. Once we had our entire consumer debt paid off in our emergency fund, we started investing. And then, listen to this. If we don't earn and invest more annually than we are right now for the rest of our lives, we will still be able to retire at the age of 65 with approximately $12 million. Here's their motive, though. This is the coolest part. It feels so good to be so young and have such financial freedom and, here's the key, and the ability to bless other people financially. Isn't that what it's all about? It's God blesses you, you be a blessing to others. And so they're saying, hey, it's not that I want $12 million to be able to have a $12 million house or you know, buy this kind of car, this kind of boat, if, but if I had a lot of money, I could give a lot of it away. They're thinking ahead and investing toward retirement. So larger emergency fund, retirement funds. Number three, this applies to some of us, college education for kids, college education for your children. Did you know that the average college student is graduating from college with over $10,000 in student loan debt? Does that surprise anybody? That, that, make, about, that make sense? Yeah. Average college student is graduating from college with about $10,000 in debt. And here's what's crazy. If you start early enough and you just invest, parents... 100 to 200 bucks a month, you can help your kiddos pay for their college education with cash. How cool would that be? And many financial advisors say it's a wise investment of your money. And then number four, and this is crazy, and some of you are like, this could never happen to me. It's happening to lots of people. Number four, fourth great way to invest your money is to pay off your home early. Pay off your home early, whether you refinance, whether you do 15 instead of 30, double your monthly payment, whatever you do, pay off your home early. And you're like, Pastor, there is no way I could do that. Let me just tell you, brothers and sisters, you read a book like this or grab some stories online, there are people that are not making very much money, that are disciplined, that are focused, that are intense, and they're paying off their homes early. And think about, think about what you could do without a house payment. Think about what you could do without a house payment, how much fun you could have with that money. Think about how much of it you could invest. Think about how much of it you could just give away. If you didn't have a house payment, you paid off your home early. Financial advisors say it's a great investment of your money. I've asked Clint uh, to share via video. He's a financial advisor that goes to our church to share the importance of investing. You guys, take a look. I graduated with a civil engineering degree at Texas Tech. My wife graduated with a marketing degree. Um, And we quickly learned that we can make lots of money, but uh, the problem was we didn't know what to do with it. Uh, And the funny thing about that is you don't have to know anything about money to spend it. Fortunately, my wife, soon after we got married, uh, interviewed with a company that actually taught families about personal finance. I, I got excited when she told me about that because we had no idea what we were doing. And we basically were able to put our own plan together and uh, get educated, which was a huge thing that I'd never done before. We found out quickly we were spending too much money on debt. Uh, We were invested in the wrong types of things. Um, I had a 401k at work, but I don't know if anybody's like me. I got all my investment advice from the guy that I was sitting next to at the meeting. Uh, So basically I had 10 options on mutual funds and I put 10% in every single one. Uh, Quickly realized uh, intentions were good but uh, a terrible way uh, to invest. After we got our plan together, uh, just a lot of stuff started happening. We started paying our debt. 
I uh, started saving a lot of money and interest in the long run, uh, get on track financially, uh, get on track for retirement. Um, and it just really gave me and my wife common goal. Um, it's amazing when you have two people that, that, that know what's going on and they're on the same page, uh, you can get things a, a lot faster. Soon after we put our plan together, I started noticing that everybody that I knew was in the exact same position as me and my wife were. We didn't understand uh, anything about money. Um, and, and I took a hard look at that and, and me and my wife started looking into how can we start helping educate uh, the people around us. Uh, last year I, I actually quit engineering. I decided I wasn't very passionate about that, but I was passionate about helping people. Uh, moved to Lubbock and we started investing our lives into educating people about personal finance. The biggest thing I've learned uh, in, in going full time in this, in this uh, field is, is you, the problems that people have is, is they fail to plan. Uh, they're misinformed or they're uninformed and, and I think uh, th this series does a great job in, in helping you understand uh, how to do things and, and, and my advice would, would be to, to get informed about things, invest some time um, and understand about how money works, um, get a plan together and uh, most importantly start investing some money. Um, that's the only way that you're going to get truly ahead in life um, and be able to retire um, is, is if you invest. got quite a few financial advisors that go to the church and if you're hearing some of these messages going hey I want to get on the right track but I need some extra help let us know and we'll hook you up with one of the financial advisors Clint is just one of them big idea today is this on the back of your card and this is the third thing we should do with the money God has given us let your money work for you rather than against you by investing let your money work for you rather than against you by investing and once again, in Matthew 6, 24, Jesus said just so clearly, he said, you can't serve both God and money. You can't serve them both. And so the question I'd like to ask you today is who or what are you ultimately serving? Is it your money, and, which is ultimately yourself, or is it the God who gave you that money? Who are you ultimately serving? The way you know that you're a servant of God is because there's been a point in time in your life where you were transformed by the Lord Jesus Christ, where you committed your life to him and your life was different after that point, where you said, Jesus, I, I know there is no way I can get to heaven on my own. I know that. My good works aren't going to get, get me there. I can't, I can't buy a ticket to heaven. I, there's no way I can get there on my own. Jesus, I recognize the only way I can get to heaven is by trusting and you not something that I do but something that you did for me and me accepting that as being sufficient to save me from my sins you had a time like that where you committed your life to Christ if you haven't that may be the decision you need to make today and that makes you positionally a servant of God now we all believers and unbelievers struggle sometimes with serving our money we all struggle with that but the question today is who do you ultimately serve is it God or is it yourself your money who is it ultimately and maybe if you've never committed your life to Christ you're like many people you're hoping that one day you've been good enough to make it you know that one day you've done enough good things right things that God's just gonna say hey good enough come on in standard for heaven's moral perfection and remember realize that moral perfection you can't make it on your own neither can I but that's why God sent Jesus that's why I sent Jesus some of you today are here and you know you need to commit your lives to Christ what keeps you from doing that today and making sure you're a servant of God and headed for heaven. But here's what I hope we all do leaving this place today, is I hope we all say, God, we realize we can only serve you or money, and sometimes we're tempted to serve our money, but God, today, as for me and my household, as for me and my family, me and my spouse, me and my kids, God, today, we're choosing to serve you. God, today, we're choosing that we want to be wise managers of the money that you've given us. Today, God, we are going to serve you. Hope we all leave saying that question today though is who are you ultimately serving let's pray God I thank you for how relevant and how practical the scriptures are and I thank you that Jesus talks a lot about money because he wants to help us know how to use the money to advance the kingdom to glorify him 
But Lord, I'm aware today that some people might say, hey, I realize I can only serve God or money, and I've never really served God before. I've really ultimately only served myself, and I've been trying hard to get to heaven and hoping that one day I'm going to get there because I've been good. But I guess I realize today I, I can't be good enough, and I need to trust in Jesus. If that's you here today, you know you've been trusting in yourself, not in the Lord Jesus, that you haven't committed your life to Christ, you can do that right now. You can make that decision right now. You can just say, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know it. I'll admit I'm not perfect. No perfect people allowed in this place. And I know that uh, I can't get to heaven on my own. But Jesus, I believe you died for me 2,000 years ago. You rose from the dead and you can forgive me and save me if I'll just ask. It's not about me doing something. It's about me deciding that I'm going to trust in you, Jesus. And I do that right now. Let this be my day in history. I'm committing my life to you. I receive that offer of forgiveness. I receive the gift of eternal life. I'm not trusting in myself or my good works to get me to heaven any longer. Jesus, I trust in you. You pray a prayer like that, it can change your life, change your eternity. Hope you'll let us know by checking on the back of your car that you're committing your life to Christ. Take you to the Welcome Center. We have a gift for you, or you can drop it in one of the connection card boxes. We'd like to know so we can pray for you. And God, for those of us that have committed our lives to Christ, we're tempted sometimes to serve our money. But God, we're just saying today corporately, we want to serve you. We want to be better managers of the money that you've given us. Help us to search the scriptures for wisdom to know how to spend the money that you've given us. And one thing we know we need to do is invest some of it, save some of it. Help us to do that starting today. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen.